Bum ba da dum bum ba dum bum ba da bum 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 bum. Okay. Hello, my name is Caleb Denby, and this is the end game class. So ignore everything you just saw on your screen. We're not talking about um, any exchange slav games today, as we were on the road to 2000, but we are talking about important end games, uh, specifically rook end games that no one really understands and everybody messes up. Um, I got the idea for this class because I myself am working through a very famous chess book by the name of Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, and there's a lot of really useful uh, and really tough information in that book. So I wanted to take some of the most important things in these Rook End games and hopefully explain them at a level that uh, more people can understand, because I think a lot of people, no offense to my chat room, but I think a lot of people who watch these streams, if they try to go through that book, they are going to struggle a bit because I myself am struggling quite a bit with some of these ideas. So pretty complex stuff tonight, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to explain it in a way that is understandable for you guys. So to start with, we're actually not going to look at this game first. This is a very famous Rook End game, which is uh, an example shown in Dvoretsky's Endgame, Endgame Manual. But first, I wanted to start with some really useful uh, theoretical ideas to know. So first and foremost, let's talk about what happens when there's no pawns on the board on this side, and we have one pawn uh, sort of in uh, away from the kings all the way on the seventh rank. In this case, we're, we're looking at a rook pawn, but this could be a knight pawn. It doesn't change too much about the, the position. Well, actually, it might, but in this case, we're, we're dealing with a rook pawn. Uh, I, I don't want to make too many bold claims unless I'm 100% certain I've like fact-checked myself on everything, but let's talk about a rook pawn. So what's the evaluation of this position? Well, while you might expect, uh, might, might, might expect it or might already know it, this is, of course, uh, is a draw. Why is it a draw? Well, the fact of the matter is white is unable to support this pawn with the king. At surface level, you might think it's a draw because black can just run the king to the queen side, take this pawn off the board, and that's sort of the end of the story. But that's where you would be wrong. Black actually has to keep this king on two very specific squares in this endgame. Why is that? Well, we see if, uh, let's say king f1, if black does get a little bit anxious and decides he wants to try to go capture this pawn, white has a really useful tactic here in the form of rook to h8. What is the idea? The point now is if you take this pawn, I will check you and take your rook and win the game. If you don't take this pawn, I'm going to make a queen. So if something like king f6 trying to avoid this rook h8 idea, now with the king off the seventh rank, you can actually get checked and I will again promote to a queen on the next turn. So black is going to have to keep this king either on g7 or h7 in order to draw the position. The bad news for white is that he can just do that. There's nothing stopping black from doing that in this case. So let's see what it's going to look like. Even though the black king is out of the game, why is it still a draw? Well, we see that even if we allow this white king up the board, let's say rook a6, rook a1, once the king gets close to the pawn, black is always able to check this king and there's actually no shelter anywhere on the board for this white king to hide from checks. So because of that, the only way to go is to come back down. But once you come down, you're obviously not helping this pawn out anymore, and it's just a draw. We're starting off pretty basic here. I think a lot of people in the chat probably already know this, but they might not know if the position changes when you add two G pawns on the board. Maybe you do know what happens, maybe you don't know what happens, but Regardless, let us talk about it here. What happens if you add two G pawns on the board? Uh, first, chat, I want to turn it to you. Can anybody tell me what happens when there are two G pawns on the board? Great Wolf asks, what if the pawn's on A6 instead? And, and we'll talk about that as well before we get into the, the game examples. But first, I want to introduce uh, this variation. Rather than moving the pawn back a square, let's talk about this particular variation. Chess King says this is still a dead draw, but do you know why this is a dead draw? Do you know why? Uh, 
Jonathan says drawn but precarious for black, and that is actually going to be the wrong answer. I'm going to blow your mind here. First of all, I think black is probably able to hold on to this pawn in this variation, but let's say black was feeling a little bit risque, right? And he just checks this king off the board, and he says, you know what? Have my pawn. Have my G pawn for free. The fact of the matter is, this is still a draw. Why is this still a draw? Well, black, uh, well, white has all the same problems as before, and having an extra G pawn actually doesn't change anything. Doesn't change anything for white. Um, the best white can do is push this pawn up the board. Let's say black allows this, but this pawn gets to G6, this king is on G7, there's nothing you can do. Now, if you remember from last week, and I'm saying I'm not saying black has to play like this, but black can play like this is the point. Even if we try to give up this A pawn and win with our G pawn, with the black king in front of the pawn like this, this is just going to be a very simple draw. Again, black is going to retreat to the back and give checks to the white king from behind. So with G pawns on the board, nothing changes. Now, let me ask you about this chess position. Does anybody know the evaluation of this chess position here? Peter Peterson says, is it still a draw with the G6, with pawns on G6 and G5? And yes, it 100% is a draw with pawns on G6 and G5. It's the exact same story. The exact same story. Where black doesn't even need the pawn. Ecclesiastic Ecclesiastic says win, but why? Why is it a win? Tell me. Tell me the reason. <clears throat> Use the F pawn to distract Black's king. Aren't we getting a little bit ahead of ourselves? I'm not asking you about the evaluation of this position. I'm asking you about the evaluation of this position. There's a pawn in your way. There is a pawn in your way, good sir. Good sirs and madams, there's a pawn in your way. You, you can't just push this. So I don't want to drag this out for too long because we have a lot to get to, but this is in fact a winning position for white. White can actually force the win of this F pawn, uh, which is pretty interesting. The way that white does it is actually through the use of Zugzwang. Uh, without Zugzwang, white would not be winning this pawn, but of course that is going to be a tactic here. Black can shuffle the king back and forth between g7 and h7, forcing white to take this path. Black can't escape with the rook. Now the king will come up the board. King g7, let's say rook back to a1. King c5, let's say we pass. King d6, let's say we pass. Now, white to move and win. Who sees the idea? Who sees the idea? Does anyone see the idea, I wonder? Uh, Chess King says black goes rook a5, and you would be correct. Black does have this resource to defend the f-pawn, which is going to make your life a little bit more difficult than you might have imagined. Then Chess King says, ah, rook c8. I'll give you a hint. While this is sometimes an idea in these endgames, you may have actually seen a very similar position. This is never going to be winning for white. Never going to be winning. The black king is in front of your pawn. So the idea is to put black in Zugzwang. How do you do that? Well, this black rook only has one square on the A file where it both defends the F pawn 
and uh, stops white from removing the rook in order to promote. And that square is a5. So once the rook goes to a5, what can black do if white is already attacking the f-pawn? Well, the only thing black can do is move the king. So now, is there any way for you to stop both the king shuffling back and forth? And, well, to stop the king from shuffling back and forth while at the same time attacking the f-pawn to make this rook move off of the crucial a5 square and win the game. And it turns out the answer is yes. The trick is you don't go king e6 when rook a5 would make it white's turn when you have no choice but to unimprove your king. But what you do is go king e5 when after rook a5 check you go king e6. What's the difference? Now it's black's turn. If this rook leaves, we take the pawn. And if king h7, king f6, Zugzwang has been achieved. The rook must leave the defense of the pawn. And we take. What's the big deal? Why is this one winning when the g-pawn wasn't? Well, even though black is able to set up a blockade of the f6 square, we can, in fact, still play pawn to f6 check with the point being, if the rook takes, our rook leaves the a8 square and we promote. And if the king takes, we check. And if the king blockades, again, this tactic of rook h8 comes into play. So this initial position is dead, lost for black, because white has this nice idea of picking up the f-pawn by the use of the zugzwang. So why are we spending our time on these technical, you know, simplified end games? Well, the fact of the matter is, this stuff is really important to know for the much, much, much more common scenario of when both sides have three pawns on the king's side and we're dealing with one outside past pawn. Why is it important to know this stuff? Well, because a lot of the drawing ideas and the winning ideas rely on a knowledge of these basic structures. So if you ever find yourself in a game facing an option to leave yourself with f-pawns or g-pawns, or maybe you're the defending side and you're trying to force it to be g pawns left on the board or f pawns on the board if you're on the you know the pressing side. It's really important to understand that this endgame, easy win, g pawns, easy draw. Okay, is everybody with me so far? Now, since we're talking about rook pawns, I did want to mention this Vancura idea that many people in the chat room have seen before. So what's the evaluation of this position? Well, it does turn out to be a draw. Um, why is it a draw? Not because, again, you have this idea of running the king to the queen's side. This, again, is going to fail. As the king steps to e7, we see a7. The king is too far away to come back. And now you can do nothing more than delay the inevitable when rook h8 is coming and winning the game. So, what's the drawing idea? It's not the same drawing idea of just waiting, because if you just wait, now my king can actually come to a useful square. That square is a7, when I do have shelter from checks. But, of course, the drawing idea here is to again check the king forever. How can we do that? Well, we use the idea of checking from the side, because there again is no shelter from checks from the side of the board. How do we manage that? Well, it's not with the Vancouver idea many of you have been exposed to with the move rook f1 check. That would be a critical mistake in this case because rook f6 would lose to rook g8 check. So be careful, but with the king over here stopping our rook f6 idea, we can just go rook c1 when now after king here, we bring our rook to the sixth rank. This is the critical idea. If it gets pushed away, we stay on the 6th rank, and the second that this rook touches the, the A pawn, we start giving checks from the side and force the king back away. And this is the drawing idea. By the way, if you ever go A7, now we transition to the drawing idea we've seen previously with the rook behind the pawn and checks from behind. Also, by the way, don't even think about stepping to this square when now you are in fact going to lose the game, stepping either here or here with the rook. How are you losing the game? Um, not with that idea, but in fact with king b5, because now once again there is shelter from checks because your king is in the way.
So that's the Vancura idea. You put the rook on the sixth rank and you check the king from the side. Uh, now I did want to jump back to a real life game. So let's look at this game between Mikhail Botvinnik and Isaac Boleslavsky. Now, since this is an endgame class, I don't care about any of what's happening here. This is all garbage. What are these chess moves? So complicated. Okay, nice little tactic here by Botvinnik, by the way. Takes, queen takes e8, transposing into a winning endgame. So in this position, we are actually going to talk a little bit uh, about something different than what we were just mentioning. So what were we just mentioning? We were just mentioning all of the positions with the rook stuck in front of the pawn and the pawn on the seventh rank, or in one case, the sixth. But let's talk about the, the slightly simpler version that we're looking at here for white. So white to move, what should white do here? Pippinchuk asks, who even realized that that was winning for white? Honestly, I probably should have credited somebody, but I don't know. Didn't do the research. Don't know who figured it out. Don't know who figured it out first. Somebody long dead. They figured that one out a while ago, so I don't feel too bad. Don't feel too bad. And yeah, you guys have the right idea. Rook b1 is an absolute must play for white. You can avoid many of the stupid complications of what we just talked about by simply playing rook b1. Rook b1 is quite easily winning here for white. Now, conversely, what should black do in order to try and save this game? Um, yeah, I think chess and math sort of have a good relationship uh, Historically, I think there were a lot of good mathematicians that were also chess players. I have always been decent at math, but nothing too crazy. So, you know, the famous Tarash rule is rooks belong behind past pawns, and that's the case here. But with black, what's the best way to try to defend? Well, it turns out in order to have any chance of saving these endgames, you want to stop this pawn as early as humanly possible. So the only real try here for black is rook c6. Point is after b5, you go rook b6 and begin to try, uh, you know, the long arduous task of holding this game. Now in the game, uh, we are going to look at the defensive side next, but first let's look at what happens if black plays as Boleslavsky did with something simple like king f7. Now with white, you should push this pawn as far forward as you can with the caveat that you always have to calculate first. Why do you have to calculate first? Well, that question becomes very relevant in this position. Should white play the move b7? And what do I mean by calculating? What are you trying to calculate if you play the move b7? Should b7 be played here? Yes or no, chat? I'll also accept you telling me what you have to calculate before playing b7. What should you calculate before you play this move? Why not rook b8? Because the king is closer to that square. So black is going to be playing rook b8 here. But we'll talk a little bit more about that defensive side as we get into it. But b7, yes or no? Everybody says no. No, no, no. But why not? Why not b7? The fact of the matter is, if you can play b7, you should play b7. The further advanced this pawn is, the better for white. But the unfortunate truth of it is that if you do play b7, you need to have calculated first. b7 actually blows the win. But why does it blow the win? Well, white has spent a little bit too much time pushing the pawn and forgot to activate the king. So now, black is actually able to draw with the simple idea of running the king to the pawn and trading into the king and pawn endgame. Uh, black is in time to get back to the king's side and stop the critical move king e6 and draw the game. So if you are busy pushing your pawn up the board, you always have to be certain that this plan of action doesn't work for black, which I should mention is why 
these positions are almost always winning for white. They're winning because black can never actually take this pawn off the board. It's too far away, and the white king is able to invade and, uh, you know, win. So, in the game, Botvinnik, of course, realized this and plays the move h3 with the idea of activating the king. Uh, we see king d5. Again, b7, I think, would be premature. King c6, king g3, and it's exactly what we just looked at. Um, so instead, simply king g3, king c6, king g4, and now, how do you try to draw the position with black? What do you guys think? Black to move and find the drawing idea. Not saying it works, but what should black do to try to draw? And by the way, the chat was saying they wanted to activate the king via g1. I, that was also fine. No, nothing wrong with that, I should mention. Nothing too wrong with that. Although maybe, just just to be you know, a little bit of a devil's advocate here, king g1, rook f8, and you might be tempted here to play b7, but again, I think that leads to a draw. So this idea, though, is enough to activate the king. Anyways, king g4, the drawing idea for black. So yeah, there is a crucial question that the chat room is split uh, on. It's whether to blockade this pawn with the king or with the rook. And it turns out the only real way to try and draw is to blockade with the king to free up the rook to help defend the king's side. If you do blockade with the rook, this is going to be a bit easier on white to uh, to crack here. Uh, you simply just push these pawns up the board. Let's say black passes, because what else can you do? Push the pawns up the board, black passes, because what else can you do? Push the king up the board, black passes, you push, black passes. And at the end of the day, uh, what is actually going to happen? Well, white's gonna push h6, takes, takes. Let's say you pass. Now it's just a matter of time before we sacrifice our b-pawn in return for the h-pawn. Can't take, because I'll check rook c7, and that's going to be the end of the game right there. Notably, even if something like this, I think still rook c7, and the g-pawn will queen. It's as simple as that for white. So the only real drawing idea is to uh, defend against this pawn with the king. It's really all you can do. I should also say, if you defend with the rook and think you are going to come to the king side with your king, I'll, I'll even give you time to do it. Um, this idea is also not going to be enough for a draw because now we can uh, leverage threats of coming to the queen side with our king along with playing on the king side with our king as well. For example, let's say you pass king e4, king e6, uh, h5, for example. You can't even waste tempi with the rook, because I'll push the pawn. King f6, king d5 wins, king d6, king f5 wins. This is much easier for white to win as well. So our last idea is to blockade with the king. And now, chat room, white to move and win. What should be played? Chess King says, I think black plays a6 before white. I assume you mean h6 in one of the lines that I was showing. And sure, then I'll play king g6, and my idea will be the same. I sacrifice my b pawn, take your king side pawns, and, and win the game. Here, though, this is black's best try. King b7 with the point that we are blockading with the king to free up the rook. So white to move and find the winning idea. It's not too late to mess this one up. Not too late to mess this one up. Pippin Chuck says h4, h5, h6. And sure, let's let's take a look. So let's say you play the move h4. Let's say you play the move h4. Now the power of this king b7 idea is that we are stopping this pawn with the king. We are immobilizing this rook with the king as well. And now 
Black is actually quite happy to play with the rook against the king on the king's side. What's the difference? Well, you're not going to run into any of those pesky, uh, sorry, excuse me, any of those pesky opposition ideas that we were dealing with here, right? Here, black had to waste a move with the king, and white's king was able to invade on one side of the board or the other. Versus, now if we are blockading with the rook, um, good luck ever crossing the fifth rank with your king. Good luck ever crossing the fifth rank with your king, and I mean ever. And if you try to come to the queen side of the board, good luck with that as well. I'm going to start taking all your pawns, right? I'm going to start taking all your pawns, and you're not even winning on this side of the board anymore with my king in front. You know, we, we know this from our basic study on last week. So h4 throws away the win. And in fact, any move here, I believe, throws away the win aside from one idea. What idea is that? Well, you actually transfer the rook from behind the pawn to the side of the pawn with the move rook e1. This is the crucial winning idea here for white. And it's an important one to know. It's an important one to know because I don't think there's really any other way to win this game with white aside from this idea of transferring the rook to the side of the pawn. Now, why is this working? Well, the point here for white is that this is uncapturable due to rook b1 check when we would trade into a winning king in pawn endgame. This one is not a draw because we get to e6 and behind the pawns. And now rook e6 is just unstoppable. Rook g8 was played in the game, which is the best try. Notably, if you go anywhere else, I can simply take all these pawns. Um, so rook g8 played, now rook e6. And what's the point? Well, the point is now we have the same ideas of attacking on the king's side, but white is the one playing with extra material now. Rather than a king versus a rook on its own trying to make something happen on the king's side, which is just impossible, we have the rook and the king working together to attack the king's side while white's rook also defends the pawn on b6. And this is the winning idea. Um, in the game, black tries this move, king a6, we see king g5 by white, king b7, black has nothing better than to pass here. Notably, if you move this rook, again, rook e7 takes, and this is just a win. The black king is far too far away, and you're never really able to hold on to this pawn. King h5, king h6, tough to stop. So that's why you see black passing, we see white just advancing up the board now h5, g4, king h4, and how do you make something happen? Well, it's the same idea that we saw before with h6. Uh, this is just the way to break through. If black plays h6, by the way, now you have to worry about this guy, and it's, it's sort of even uh, simpler than before. Now we can, number one, just run our king all over the board, or perhaps even simpler, go with this pass, and then... Um, even king g4, for example, and h6. Uh, why king g4? Well, I didn't want to get checked. And this is as simple a win as they come. Uh, okay, so in the game, though, we see h6, g takes, rook takes, now rook g7 to defend the final pawn. We see king h5, king a6, and now white to move once again, see if you can find the simplest way to win this game. Steve says, wow, only works because the pawn is on the B file. If it was on the C file or closer, then the white king cannot get to E6 in time. Um, I don't feel comfortable responding to that question with a definite answer because I have not, have not done the analysis there. Toblerone says, who's the greatest endgame artist? You vote Capablanca. Capablanca was definitely the first real great endgame player, I would say. Chess King says g5, and okay, I won't waste too much of your time here. I think every move wins, to be honest, every reasonable move at least, but in my opinion, the simplest and easiest is actually to go rook c6 with the idea that the time is right to give up um, this pawn. King b7, of course, would be uh, horribly losing in the king and pawn endgame. In the actual game, black tried rook e7, but White's idea is still to give up this pawn and go for a winning uh, rook and pawn endgame. Um, we see king b6, rook h7, king e6, and now White simply pushes this pawn. 
and with the king able to get in front of the pawn, the black king cut off, it's going to be a simple win by virtue of the Lucena position. Uh, rook a1, g7, check, 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 king e7, and now of course white to move and win. We've all seen this one before if you watched last week's, le last week's lecture. You go rook e2 check, king d7, rook e4, and king f7, building a bridge with the rook. And here is where black decided to throw in the towel and resign. So very instructive endgame on the rook being behind the pawn. Um, I should state, by the way, g5, these moves all, all win the game as well. Black is still sort of forced into this passivity, and it's it's only a matter of time before the, the end uh, kind of arrives. And actually, I, I do have a table blaze open, and it says even b7 wins, which is a little bit surprising to me. But apparently even this wins. What's the idea? Ah, this is the idea. Okay. But... It's a bit unnecessary to give up the pawn like that. Perhaps we should just start with this. When again, we are taking this H pawn and winning with G6. So questions on this end game with the rook behind the pawn, preferably questions that I can answer because this question of would this be winning if the pawn was a bishop's pawn, those types of questions I, I can't just answer off the cuff. Um, these end games are more case by case basis than I think a lot of people realize. And is it winning if it's a bishop's pawn? My gut instinct would be yes, it's still winning somehow. But um, probably the, the difference is the white king would have to be closer before going for these, these ideas. You might not be able to push the pawn as far in order to ensure that you're still winning the king and pawn end games. So complicated, no way you could find these awesome moves in an endgame. You actually didn't use the word awesome, I don't know where I came up with that. But the point of the lecture is to introduce you to these ideas. So first and foremost, we had this idea that everybody kind of knew. Put the rook behind the pawn. Then we have this idea to push it as far forward as possible. But you always want to ensure that the ensuing king and pawn endgame is winning. That's why you don't see the pawn to be 7. And then the critical idea that I think is new to a lot of people is when the king starts to blockade the pawn, you do want to make the switch to guarding the pawn from the side, not guarding the pawn from behind. From then, it's just a matter of forcing a weakness on the king's side and eventually sacrificing your pawn for the king's side pawns. That's the winning method here. Can I make it a quick summary? I think that's what I just did, hopefully. But let us move on to another Rook and Pawn endgame, and I want to look at this one from the defensive side, and again, it's going to be everybody's hero, Mikhail Botvinnik. So again, this is an endgame class. This is all garbage. I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. Okay, this is an endgame, but it's not technical enough for us. Uh, I do want to say, very nice move here by Botvinnik to go for the draw. In these endgames where you're pawned down and trying to draw, you want to liquidate as much as possible, get pawns off the board, which is why this move b4 is a good one. Uh, in the game, you see rook a3, bc5, and now Botvinnik is able to uh, leverage the c pawn against one of the queen side pawns, unfortunately not both of them, otherwise it would be simple, and get to this position. Uh, here, rook takes b3 is the idea. Rook takes c7, rook a3, rook a7. And here, white to move. White to move. What should white play? Steve says, is that why you start with the blockade with the rook on b6 so you can replace it with the king? So yes, Steve, that, that is the idea. Although I, I do want to say in that first example, it's not quite as clear as I would have liked. We can take a look at it. But this example is, is a lot more clear of, of a drawing idea for white. So what should we start with here, with the white pieces? What should we start with here? How do you start? And yet, Eduardo has the right idea. You must stop this pawn in its tracks as early as possible. Why is that? Well, we're going to see in just a moment. So rook a4 is definitely, definitely, definitely the best move in the position. You stop this pawn in a5 before it gets to a4. And that matters for the reason that um, I believe it was Peter uh, 
same reason that maybe it wasn't Peter. It was the same reason that Steve just said. Um, uh, partially for that reason, where when you uh, keep the pawn further up the board, sometimes you have these ideas of replacing the rook with the king and using the the king to, the rook to try to draw. But also in every variation, there are going to be times when your king king or rook need to leave the pawn. And if you need to leave the pawn, it's much better to have three tempi to spare than two tempi to spare than one tempi to spare, right? You want this pawn as far back as possible to give you these active ideas on the other side of the board. So that being said, king g5 is what was played in the game. And here, who can tell me a really, really crucial drawing idea for white? How should white ever try to draw this game? What do you guys think? What can be done? What can be done? Yeah, Great Wolf says spend a tempo now to save a tempo later. And not only that, it's sort of like the okay <laughs> I, I think i've already explained it but yes great wolf essentially has the right idea there though it is not always that simple that you know it's not immediately obvious why a tempo now is worth less than a tempo later but we shall see at the end of this line crusoe says trading all the pawns unfortunately trading all the pawns is not really an achievable goal for white White has one really important idea in mind here. And the crucial drawing idea for White in these endgames is to make a passed pawn. So let's see how Botfinnick goes about doing it, and then we'll see why it's such a good idea for White. So what Botfinnick starts with here is the move pawn to f3. Why is this move so good? Well, the point is, black really only has one idea, and that is to bring the king to the pawn on the queen side. This is what we uh, see black trying to achieve. There's no other way to sort of force this rook away, and it's not like the king is going to break through to the king side when, again, we have our rook in such an active position. It's sort of a stark difference to the position we just saw, right? In the previous position, we saw... Um, the white king able to sort of attack the king side uninhibited because the pawn was further advanced. Imagine, for example, the, the rook on a2 and the pawn on a3. Then this becomes a very relevant winning idea, whereas now the king will have to evict this rook before, um, before going for anything on the king side. So this is the crucial idea to start with for black. Now white is going to play the move g4, and this is the point of f3. We go g4. Pawn takes should be played. If you don't take, now white is going to go here, here, and white to move in this position. Does anybody have it? White to move here. What can white do? What can white do? Am I one of the kids from that beginner's kids video uploaded seven years ago? Maybe I did attend a few classes when I was a bit younger, but I wasn't exactly a regular, so it's sort of a uh, sort of unlikely. So you guys have your heart in the right place, but the wrong specifics. So you are correct to want to go after the weakness that we just created on H5. White's idea is to create a passed pawn for counterplay. However, Rook h4 is not the way to do that. Uh, rook h4, and unfortunately for you, your rook is too far away to catch this pawn. Too far away. You just can't get there in time. Can't get there in time. So rook h4, not the way to do it. But you do want to go after this pawn, but you do so with the king. And the point now is that black is far too slow on this side of the board compared to us on our side of the board. Rook a1, a4 king h5, and now we will be able to take black's last pawn and fight back with our own passed pawns over here. Um, even if, for example, rook h7 
uh, here, white has a really nice idea of a frontal attack on the pawn, which is an idea I don't think I've introduced yet. Maybe I should have for this one specific reason, but I kind of forgot this was an important idea uh, in this particular um, position. I think there are other ways to draw here for white, by the way, like this isn't necessarily forced, but a really useful idea to remember is you can, in this particular position, just keep the black pieces at bay with this particular idea of checking and attacking the pawn from the front, and black is not able to really do anything against this. Um, okay, so that's what happens if king e5. We go g takes h5, and we go after this pawn on h5 and push our h pawn and take this f-pawn. Does, does everybody understand that? Does that look complicated still to anybody? It's fine if it does, because these are pretty complex ideas. It's fine if it does. Toblerone says it looks quite simple. Fair enough. But life isn't always so easy. H takes g4 is a bit of a better try. Now king e5, and black's pawns are not so easy to attack. We can't exactly get after that guy with our king. So white to move here. What should be played? What should be played? White to move in this position. And yeah, Torches has the right uh, answer here. Once again, we don't necessarily have to win pawns on the king's side. All we have to do is make a passed pawn. And the way to do that is with pawn h4. Now king d5, for example, is the only winning try played in the game. h5 takes, takes. And now it's very clear that black's efforts on the queen side of the board are not going to be fruitful. We can just push this pawn forward, support it from behind. Now black is the one who has to be careful and uh, guard against this h-pawn coming forward, and white is in zero danger here, in zero danger. Any move draws for white. Okay, well now probably we should, we should, we should stop this pawn, I should mention. So king e3, a3, it, it is worthwhile to stop this pawn, otherwise a2 and rook takes h6 comes, but still no danger at all here for, um, for white. By the way, drawing idea here for white, again, no shelter for this king. Check, back, it's a draw. It is a draw. So, instead, black in the game tries to go king e6, h6, king f7, with the point being that black is now going to try and capture our h-pawn. So, what can white do this? What can white do here? It's Tor 5, not Tor. Understood, Tor 5. Understood. White to move and draw. You understand that my name is my name is nobody. Um, yeah, the problem is I am trying to explain these ideas, but these are the types of rook endgames that everybody, in, including very high-level players, can often get wrong. So I think no one is almost a fair assessment of that. Um, as I said, uh, a lot of these positions come from Dvoretsky's endgame manual, which I'm working through myself. And there are even some positions where um, I, I think almost a direct quote is like, and here I don't dare judge whether white's position is enough for a win. <laughs> you know, it's like, he's like, I think this is white's best try, but I, I can't even judge if this is enough. So yes, the correct idea is the critical move rook g4. Rook h4, by the way, is actually going to lose the game in this case to king g6 when our pawn is dead ever so sadly. So rook g4, uh, just, just to highlight here, king g6, king f2. Um, our pawn does die uh, to rook h7, and, okay, well, actually, hold on. Our, our pawn does die, but, hold on. Our pawn dies to king h7, blockading the pawn, when eventually our rook will have to sacrifice itself for the a4 pawn. Took me a little bit to get there, but no reason to calculate all of that. You just go rook g4, cutting the king off, and drawing the game. 
a4 would be a mistake in light of rook g7 check, and rook takes a7. So king f8 was played in the game, but now we start to see the power of white's idea, rook f4, pawn is attacked. So rook a6, defending the pawn, but now rook g4, threatening h7. So rook a7, stopping h7, but now rook f4, threatening black's pawn. And black gave it the only try he could with king g8 to stop h6, giving up this pawn, pushing up the board. But now, white is in plenty of time to get in front of the pawn. Go king f2, go king e3, and white's king is their first drawing the game. So to recap, the drawing idea here for white's is number one, stop this pawn as early as possible. Number two, try to create a passed pawn or weakness that you can attack with the king on the king's side of the board, and then use that passed pawn as a decoy to keep black from making progress on the other side, and draw the game, as we see. Um, notably, by the way, ideas like this don't work either. h7 is coming, and again, nothing doing here for, uh, for black. Can even take on a4. Okay. So questions on this endgame before I explain how this endgame is not as simple as it may seem now. <clears throat> questions here before I talk about, you know, how it's actually not all so simple. All right. Well then, let's talk about how it's not so simple. So what could black have done differently? Well, let's first examine this position. Uh, perhaps a better try for black would have been king g5. And what's the point of king g5? Well, the point is, you know, it may be true that you are threatening to make a passed pawn, but by playing this move g4, you may have given my king an inroad to the king side with the winning idea that we saw from the first game. Um, fortunately for white, you are able to stop this king from invading uh, quite easily. You go king g2, king h4, and now h3. And black passes, but you can pass as well, right? So let's say g5, king h2. And, well, okay, with g5, you're obviously still mating your own king and committing this idea, but black could have passed any other way, and again, king h2 is the response. So black's perhaps only winning try here is to try and go after the king's side pawns directly, giving up the a pawn. Um, if you don't do this, then you are simply not making progress on this side of the board. f5 is only playing into white's idea of making a passed pawn. So g5, king h2, rook b7, rook takes a5, rook b2 check, king g1, king takes h3. Who knows the evaluation of this position? Who knows the evaluation of this position? Think back to last week's lecture on basic rook endgames, because that's going to come in handy here. Eduardo asks, what if there's an other, another line besides h6, g4? So we looked at what happens if black ignores the g4 pawn, white takes on h5 and targets it with his king. Tor 5 chess says rook a3, rook a4, uh, means rook a4. Yeah, rook a4 is not going to be good enough. Not going to be good enough here. You are losing that guy. Boo says draw, Mario says rook f5. Rook f5, not going to be good enough. Rook b6, and you're losing that guy. Two pawns. Two pawns is good. Two pawns is good. Rook a6, well, king takes g4. Are you drawing after rook a6, king takes g4? You're right that rook a6 is the best try. But are you drawing after king takes g4? Are you drawing after king takes g4? 
So good job finding rook a6. We, we spotted the tricks now for black. But are you drawing after king g4? This is the question. And the answer, of course, is yes. Why are you drawing? Well, because it is a knight's pawn. And if you guys were paying attention in lecture number one last week, you'll know that after king g3, rook f1, we have the passive defense. And this is enough against the knight's pawn. We simply shuffle our rook back and forth on the first rank and cannot lose. So well done to anybody who spotted that. Rook, a, rook b1, by the way, doesn't change anything. Uh, white is still easily drawing here. So rook a6 and white barely draws against this idea of king g5, king h4. So maybe both players spotted this in the game, but this would have been a bit of a better try. Uh, remembering that you always have to be careful when you make inroads for the black king. Again, just to point out for the question asker, if black ignores this, we go after this pawn with the king and again manage a draw. And lastly, maybe in light of all these ideas, king g5 was actually a little bit wrong. For example, what happens on king g7? What's the difference? Well, what if we try the exact same thing? King f7. Now g4 is not coming with check, and maybe black could consider playing something like f4, trying to lock things up, and this idea could potentially be gaining in power, right? How are we making a passed pawn here? f4, king e7, uh, maybe even king e6, but the point now is that black is going to lock things up on this side of the board, and it's not so clear how, black, how white is making a passed pawn. In fact, maybe even g5 here by black is the most accurate, making sure this isn't a target either. And the answer is, I don't know what's going on here. This would be, I think, a lot tougher for white to deal with, with this plan of coming over to the queen side, coming a lot more quickly from black. So what should white do against king g7? Turns out the best line, as given by Dvoretsky, is king g2, king f7, king f3. Why is this better than the f3 line? Well, we have the same ideas that we were just looking at, but now our king is going to help us in our quest to make a passed pawn or make a target for us to take and then get a passed pawn. And what is going on here? Well, I think the best try for black is to go uh, king e6 when we respond with g4. Now after h4, we can go king e4, with the point being we stop black from invading and we have um, the nice idea of continuing now with the move um, f4. Although I'm messing up the line slightly. Okay, the line I had prepared was g5 by black first. The point now after g4, h4, white cannot go after this pawn. If you do go king e6, now I think g4, h4, king f4 is the idea with um, g5 to follow. So g5 by black. And now the point is going to be king f5 by white or f4 followed by king f5. Again, making a target just in time. So once again, though, black perhaps can um, pose white some extra problems here. Uh, how can black pose white some extra problems? Hold on. Let me remember my analysis really quick. G4, what was the problem for white. Honestly, I'm not remembering. I think this g4 idea is enough to draw. There was one more tricky line that I think I'm forgetting or missing for black, but this is going to be enough for, for a draw by white. Um, there was some idea where black is able to uh, force the white king back a little bit. I think if you capture it like this, for example, uh, and go king d5, it can still be tough. The idea, though, once again, is simply to make a passive pawn on the king's side, as we've seen before, king b5, rook a1. Uh, and now, if we start pushing the pawn, we go f5, and it's impossible to stop white from getting the passed pawn and drawing the game. For example, takes, or g5, is the same. Now, both sides, same number of passed pawns, and a draw. Okay. So what is the point of this defensive idea that we looked at here? The point is that in order to draw these positions, white or the defending side should strive to create a passed pawn 
on the opposite side of the board to deal with the pawn uh, that the, the stronger side has. And that's what we saw work for white in this game, and we saw the winning technique for Botvinnik in this case with the crucial switching of the rook to defending from the side. So that is unfortunately where I'm going to have to call it for this lecture. I actually had one more really complicated rook end game to show you guys tonight, but it will have to wait for next week, or maybe this is where, where we will call it quits on these rook end games, because I know this stuff is really complicated, but I do think it is vitally important to know. It will save you games or get you extra half points when maybe you don't fully uh, deserve them. So final questions on these rook end games that are answerable. By, by me. Of course, there are some answers that no one has just yet because these endgames are incredibly complicated. Final questions. All right. Well, I'm not saying too much. That is going to be where I call it for tonight. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you're watching live, please head on over to the Twitch channel for another edition of Analyze Your Games, my class where I analyze your games. Um, and if you're watching the YouTube version, that is going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.